Hey, hey, welcome to Over the Horizon. There's some breaking news today. We're seeing a generational shift in robotics at a company that has led the search for the ultimate humanoid bot for many years uh, before falling behind a bit. We're talking about Boston Dynamics, and they've just brought out, uh, well, the retired Gen 1, uh, which is Atlas, which was a hydraulics-based uh, bot, and now they've come out with an all-electric Gen 2 of Atlas. Very interesting. Let me get in our everybody's uh, robotics expert and guru and go-to guy, a robotics pioneer, Scott Walter. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Royden. Yeah, it's definitely a lot to talk about here and a lot to unpack. Oh, yeah. Um, Fascinating. If anyone saw the, the video from last night, which was the retirement of Atlas. Yeah. End of an era. It was very sad, um, you know, to sort of see that. Uh, and we weren't quite sure. It was like, was this boss dynamics putting up the white flag when it came to humanoid bots or was it, we're waiting for the other shoe to drop. <laughs> and this morning the other shoe dropped and that is the all electric, which I think you could oh, yeah. see it coming in a way. Yeah. 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 I guess, I guess, you know, it's, it's, it's a great way to say bye to gen one of Atlas with a little blooper roll. You know, in the, news yeah, business, I mean, the television yes, business, uh, business at the oh, end of the year. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> so, and, but the thing is, isn't there usually supposed to be a bit of a mourning period before you, you show the, uh, the next version? <laughs> and see, see, actually, you know, uh, so today's the 17th of April. Mm -hmm. And um, so they, they on the 16th, they, they put the video out yesterday showing the retirement. So today they're showing the new one. But anyone who's from Boston knows the significance of April 19th. And yeah. that is what's known as Patriots Day, which is usually when the Boston Marathon is supposed to be run, but it always has been a Monday, which is why on the 15th. And uh, that's the start of the American Revolution. And so yeah. they could have picked a day about that. But then having just said it, maybe it's not such a great idea. <laughs> they put it on the day where there was a the start of a revolt. Um, but still, it's it's something else to see that. And you can see from the bloopers, I mean, uh, Atlas was hydraulically actuated, and there are a few places yeah. there where it falls down. You do see a blowout, and you see like, the hydraulic. From the knees, right? Yeah. Now, let, let's remember there that. Okay, there we go. Boom. You know, it's um, <laughs> part of the reason we're seeing so many humanoid robots right now is because yeah. there's this convergence of technologies that is allowing right. it to be possible. And when Boston Dynamics was starting this 10 years ago, you didn't have that convergence of technologies allowed it, especially like in the actuator spaces. Like, yes, there were electric motors and stuff like that, but not those that could really do the, the, the power and responsiveness and everything else that they needed. So they went with hydraulics. Now, this is history kind of repeating itself, is that the original industrial robots that came from Unimation, right, the Unimit 1, which are like around 1960, I think the first one was sold in 1961 to, to General Motors, and that was uh, electro-hydraulic, um, hydraulic, I mean, the first three axes that basically the waste motion and everything that was in there, that was all done hydraulically because you didn't have motors that were powerful enough to do it. And then out towards the wrist, they started to have some um, electrical servos out there, but still it was a big bulky bot. And that like that defined what an industrial robot was for about 12 years, because it wasn't until 1972 that ABB, or actually I should say ASEA, they were called ASEA at that time, came out with the world's first all electric robot. And it was only five axes. It wasn't six at the time. And eventually you get more on those as these things get lighter and tighter and you can be able to do it. So it took a dozen years, you know, yeah, a dozen years back then to basically go from hydraulics to that. So we shouldn't be surprised that, you know, the first humanoid kind of starts out that way and it takes a little while to be able to replace it. And yeah. it was an R&D platform. Now, Boston Dynamics has electric bots. You know, spot for mm. one, that's, that's electric. Um, and then they, they worked on stretch and handle and some of the, um, yeah, so, so those, and those are also electrically actuated. So they know how to build electric actuators or at least use them. They've, they've been around. So it was just kind of like, why are they, they hang on, hang on to this uh, for such a long time. And that is that, you know, they had a skunk works going on where they were working on <laughs> the next generation and, you know, learning a lot about it and it's definitely a revolutionary design the standpoint of Boston Dynamics. And when we look at it, we'll see it's a bit unique and, and a few of the things that they're doing um, and some things that, let's say, are uh, are similar to some of the other bots that are out there. 
yeah, yeah. All right. So just just before we get into this new video, really exciting, quite a bit weird. I just just the way it moved and stuff. I was yeah, yeah. To... There there was this uncanny valley, and I guess I, the first thing is that when I saw the video, the first thing I remember was that that opening line from Poltergeist. They're back. <laughs> okay. The second thing I remembered what, what, with the head turning was like mm, Exorcist. <laughs> And so just, if you get those vibes, and then, of course, you went right to the Lost in Space vibe. Uh, I know, right? Yeah, yeah so because there's, there's a lot to unpack, yes. Yeah, yeah. But but very quickly, let, let's just go back in time. And uh, remember, this started off as a DARPA project. Yes, yes. And, and when you listen to people that um, were part of that project, they talk about that that was absolutely seminal because it planted the seeds all over the place. And... Um, you know, there are other challenges after where, you know, certainly autonomous uh, vehicles also go back to similar uh, DARPA challenges. Yeah, yeah. And so a lot of the researchers and everyone else is here and that when, you know, when the history is written, they're going to say that was a very important project. You know, yeah. that wasn't just the government like throwing some money around, people doing a few things because they had to come up with these platforms, they had to work on it. They found everything that was wrong because that's what engineering is about. It's, yeah, it's about working sure. on design and finding everything that's wrong with design and how you have to make it better and better and better. It's that iteration. So yeah. um, it is absolutely a very important, and Boston Dynamics was the center of that because they were pretty much building a platform that all these other researchers were able to, to use and start to develop on top of. Yeah. All right. So let's talk about this new video that's uh, just come out. Um, it's fascinating. It starts off on the floor, and then it starts doing some really, really, really weird things. Um, shall we just start? Shall just, we just, just watch play it through. through? And yeah, yeah it, it's short enough, and we'll let the audience get their own impression, and then we'll go through frame by frame. Yeah, yeah this, whoa, yes, exorcist. <laughs> yes, and then again. And this head. Yes. Mm -hmm. Now, evidently, uh, Robert Plater, who is the CEO of Boston Dynamics, already did uh, an interview this morning so it must have been yep. made a few days ago and then embargoed yep. because i can't believe they could get so much uh so quickly and he talked about a lot of these things and then trying to design a head because atlas didn't really have a head and they wanted to put one on there that wasn't threatening that uh was kind of friendly in a way and was communicative so there's a big question do you need a head to rotate yes or no and the original optimus one did not and then it did and James Dama kind of pointed out, well, part of that is to communicate to people around there what is the intention of it. And it seems to be that they agree because that's what he said in the interview is that a lot of it was to kind of, you know, communicate the intent and where the focus is, you know, which ways, if it can walk forwards and backwards, you've got to do something to let it know what, which is the front direction right now, which way is it really thinking of going. So um, that's, that's a pretty interesting interview that describes some of the design choices that they went through and what they wanted to do. So they've been working on it for a while. They know how to build actuators, which was, was mentioned there. And they wanted to make them, you know, basically get as much power density in them as possible. And sort of surprising, and one of the reasons why Atlas, the old Atlas, um, was so powerful is because hydraulics are extremely powerful. I mean, you can deliver a lot of force at a distance really quickly with them. Yeah. No doubt about the amount of, and that's why you can do backflips and everything else because boom, the amount of power you can get instantaneously. Um, yeah. It's really hard to try to match that with an uh, electro server without a lot of engineering design and putting it in there. But he's saying the new Atlas is stronger than the old one. And, yeah. And, and actually, Incredible. I was expecting the new one to, to be less strong for a reason. And that is a few years ago, um, Boston Dynamics is at a conference talking about the humanoid bot in its place in society and the potential of being in, in the home and everything else. And they, they sort of mentioned that, well, one of the problems is that is a safety concern, that these bots are very powerful and um, you be a bit concerned. And they said, they have no problem being near spot. You know, spot doesn't feel threatening to them. It, it's because it doesn't have quite as much power, but no one really wants to be near Atlas when it's performing because, you know, there's a lot of power there. And so the fact that the new Atlas has that, you know, is, is as strong, um, uh, um, you know, that, that's rather interesting, which says a lot about the actuator designs that they were able to come up with. Do you, do you know, offhand, do you remember offhand how much uh, Gen 1 of Atlas weighed? Because it oh, looks it's around like 200 it, pounds. I mean, if it hit, 
It was it was it was close to two hundred pounds. It was pretty heavy. Whoa! It was very short. It was under five. So feet if tall. it bumped into you, yeah, it fell on you. It's going to hurt. Yeah, I mean yeah. that. This is the thing: is that um, uh, Ben Bordnick of One uh, X. You know, he, he's designing a bot that he really wants to go into the home, mm. and their bot only weighs sixty pounds. And he says, you know, that's the threshold right there. Once you start to get higher than that, then you have the safety concerns because if all the bot has to do is just fall on you, and that's going to hurt. And, uh, and you know, nothing to do with like, you know, intentionally hitting you or running into you or, or like elbowing you or anything like that. Just, just yeah. that weight alone can be a lot. So we don't know the specs. I haven't seen the, the specs on this exactly how many degrees of freedom we, we can kind of break it down and start to do an analysis. Um, but I have a feeling it's not at that 60 pounds and, you know, it might mm-hmm. be, it, it's probably, you know, I think the Tesla bot and the others are aiming to be around 50 to 55 kilograms which would be right. like you know, 120 pounds, something like, 120 like that. Pounds, so again, I mean, one X is talking about half that. You yeah. know? It's like if, yeah. if they're able to get 60 pounds versus uh, you know, like 120 pounds. And so I bet. Correct me if I'm wrong. Isn't, isn't is one X also hydraulic? No. Oh, okay. No, it's, it's, wow. it's, it's, it's electric uh, with some sort of interesting actuators where they use a lot of tendon control. So they're also looking at oh, I see. Okay. the concern of, of stiffness. So, the, the thing with having these particular types of joints that are in here, which have a lot of power, they're also very stiff. So they are are not, when they bump into something, they're going to have to react really, really quick. And even then you're going to feel a little bit of bruising that comes with it. So mm. um, th- this is going to be you know, more of an industrial setting. And again, this is still a development platform. This is not the right. final version of what it's going to look like. This is yeah. their their first attempt at an all electric design, which is going to be refined as you go over time to think about how to be able to manufacture it and everything else. Um, however, they've already done a very good job of making sure there's no cables and everything else. I mean, it, it almost doesn't look like something you just whip together in a lab. There's been a lot of thought in this thing to be able to make sure there are no snag points and, and, and other issues. There are some pinch points and a few things that would have to be covered up to really be able to work closely with humans. But to me, this looks like it's more for an industrial setting at this point, as opposed to uh, the home setting. Um, right. And there are advantages and disadvantages to, I don't know if you want to call it the creep factor <laughs> that's in there, the <laughs> double jointedness, but we, yeah. let's say I saw foreshadowing of them thinking double jointedness would be a good thing. So they're the first one that really are going double joint. I think there's like one other Japanese uh, or, or Chinese uh, bot out there that sort of showed um, extended range of motion. Most of the humanoid bot companies are trying to avoid extended range of motion, partly for creep factor and partly because it's very difficult teleroboticly to teach a bot to have like, you know, a double joint in your elbow or stuff like that. <laughs> It's, it's a, people, right. Humans just don't do that. So that means you're going to yeah. need a, a lot of simulation and, and different policies for being able to do something that's very hard to sort of show from a demonstration example. Yeah, but they talk seem about tying yourself up in the knots. Right, right. Now, um, about a month ago was sort of the last video of, of, of Atlas doing something. Um, that everyone might re- remember, and and that was picking up what, what looked like these um, these struts um, out of out of a bin, and then putting them over um, on on shelving. And this is the first time we saw Atlas with a hand, and so we can see the fingers that are on there. And it was, I think, it's like a three finger hand, and it works by being double jointed. So that means any one of them right. can become the thumb if you want to think of it that way. Uh, as, as far as something which is which is opposing. And it's kind of in, an elegant engineering solution to a kind of all-purpose gripper that you might see in an industrial setting, but it's not mm. necessarily the ideal hand to, yeah. to operate in the human environment. Um, in many ways, when you looked at it, it almost was like, why, why are they showing it? It's almost it's like there's a certain amount of desperation that kind of... Yeah came through that thing. It's like, you know, why are they doing this? Is it just to being relevant? Cause we hadn't seen anything for a while or right. is it just because they started to work on some design now and they're getting ready for it. So when I saw the retirement video yesterday, I wasn't sure. It's like, okay, do they really throw up um, the white flag or is it really just saying that? Okay. Yeah, that was my, that was my first, <laughs> but, 
But if you look at it again, the okay. fingers are double are double jointed there. Right. When we go to this video, you're going to see the exact same hand design is used. Right. So you'll you'll see that they didn't throw away all that development. They decided that's the hand we want to have. There it is. So it does have a hand, but it doesn't have your typical human hand. It seems to have the exact same kind of design that, that they've been going with. Right. Is it still a three-fingered hand or a four-fingered hand? That's what it looks like. It, it looks like it's just three fingers. Yeah. So it's, it's the three-finger hand. It looks like it's it's the same. It, it's hard to get like a really good frame to a really good close-up. I was able to get a close-up on a couple of other things. So you know, if we want, we could start from the very beginning. So what's one of yeah. the first things I noticed uh, when it's That's lying cool. on the ground? Because on the ground right there, we can see there's a, a lot of, of venting going on in many different places. So when you look around where all the different actuators are, you see they've put in a lot of holes in there to make sure they can get good airflow. So mm -hmm. that means they're they're concerned, they're consuming a lot of power. There's a lot of heating, they need to dissipate the heat. So that's a, the, the first thing you will notice. So again, if, if we look at that, they've got a lot of heat dissipation that's uh, they're probably concerned with. But also, they've cleaned up the kinematics in some areas, but some areas I think they still need to do a little bit of element. The, the, the wrist, um, because they've decided to do a rotary all the way there, it's still a bulky wrist. And you've got the, that movement, which is kind of your, your yaw movement, which is happening like way back here. <laughs> you know, Rather than yeah. being up where the yeah. wrist is, that movement is in a very unnatural location and will still seem a bit uncanny. Um, and then you've got, you know, further down here, you have this. So maybe they're deciding, well, that kind of breaking of the wrist is really unusual, but we're going to put it there. But that, again, it takes up space. You've got a motor that you barely need to move, having to now carry the payload of the rest of the hand that's going on through there. Um, that's why I prefer some of the other designs everyone's used with for the wrist to, to make it a little bit smaller because it articulates at the location where you want rather than being kind of offset like that. Um, right. And then you get the, the hand design. So they're, they're going with that kind of design, which may be more towards the industrial market as opposed to being able to work in your kitchen. Because I don't think those fingers are going to work very well in your kitchen. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, now, um, yeah, it, yep. speaking of fingers, do you, do you need a, a five-finger hand to, to work in a household? Not necessarily. Um, okay. And it's been a huge debate amongst everyone on whether they should do that. Uh, we, we know from Walter Isaacson's book, that was a big debate in the Optimist team on whether mm. to go four fingers and stuff like that. Uh, three fingers is like the minimum that you really need for the contact point. So you can make the argument for that. Um, whether you need to actually have five, that's a good question. It depends upon are there, is there really any equipment that you really need five fingers, you know, with, um, with a drill? I mean, obviously if you want to play the piano and there, there are some things which are kind of around the idea that you have five fingers to be able to do it, but working most things, probably not. It's a question of also how thick your fingers are. Sometimes really big fingers, like, you know, you're all thumbs and, and you get kind of clumsy. It's hard to have the dexterity you need to go in there. So it really depends on what you're looking at. I have a feeling that's something they're going to clean up on. They've decided that, you know, let, let's get an all electric body. Let's start working on it. Let's decide what the hand designs are going to be. And, and they're using all rotary motors, but not all the actuation is done rotationally. And, and I'll kind of point out what I mean about that is that um, at first, you get the impression everything is rotary here. You know, the knees look like the rotary, you know, definitely around the, the waist. You might think that the, the ankles and stuff like that. The wrist definitely is all rotary. So uh, the arms. So, okay, we see a lot of motion there. We're also seeing this double jointed kind of motion here that where they're demonstrating what we can do. And I'm not even sure I've ever seen a gymnast do this <laughs> or contortionist. <laughs> I mean, that is that is an incredible amount of flexibility yeah. that you're seeing yeah. here. And no amount, amount of, of power, yoga is going to get yeah, you to do that. Right. Now, one thing you can see really closely here is that the question is, do they have an actuator built into the knee? Now, they do have the actuator built into the elbow. So I'm pretty sure the elbow is both the hinge joint and the actuator. The knee, it's actually further up. I, you can kind of see at the top part of the, the leg, this big rotary area, which is probably where the servo is that then uses a connecting rod that goes down to the knee. So the, the knee is basically... It's a hinge joint that has a rod that you pull on it and which the, the motor for that is much further up because the knee is a very important joint. You need a lot of power. And then sometimes the only way to get the power is you, you need to have a really big actuator. So you put the actuator yeah. where you've got the space to be able to put it. 
So yeah. that's why I'm saying they're taking rotational motion to turn it into like a linear motion and the linear motion then it's like pulling like a lever to create the other rotational motion. So yeah. it's kind I mean, of like the amount of power to get yeah. to get that entire mass off the ground from from this yes. position. Yes, 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 you need that. And then we'll see the same thing. It's hard to see that on the but on the ankles, basically they have the same ankle design that Tesla and everyone else has for the wrist. So they've worked on that design already. I'm surprised they've decided not to do the same thing up at the wrist, but definitely down the ankle, that seems to be what they're doing that, you know, up where your normal calf muscles are, oh, yeah, that looks, is where they yeah, have the actual like rotary actuators. Yes. And I don't think they're using linear actuators in there, but again, what they're doing, and we'll see many other bots have done this, like agility has done this P and D others are using these rotary actuators to make these connecting rods go back and forth to be able to get the movement that you need on the ankle. So, so that's pretty clear where they're, where they're doing that. Um, the shoulder is kind of like the standard Yaw Patrol shoulder. However, they have made a couple of differences there and also in the waist. And so when they get up and give us a good view, I'm going to kind of point out uh, what I see there that I like. Now, yeah. about a month ago, there was like another Chinese startup that came out called P&D Robotics. They don't have a whole lot of presence out there, but um, I really like their design because they were yet another Chinese humanoid bot company that came out that didn't wholesale copy someone else's design. Yeah. They went out and they studied, they did a very good study of what everyone's doing, found the pieces they kind of liked, integrated that into the design and modified. Them. Okay. So, so, which means they, they understood why people did something and they made a bunch of changes. Hmm. And a lot of the changes were changes that I've been saying, I wish they would kind of work on. And um, one of them was like up on the shoulder is everyone else's shoulder is sort of mounted perfectly horizontally. I wish that they, everyone would add like an angle anywhere from, from 10 to 15 degrees on the shoulder mount to get away from what's known as like the shoulder singularity when your arm is straight out like that. And um, Boston Dynamics has done that as well. So it seems to be a slight one. And I'm sure, I think even the Tesla bot Gen 2 may have done that uh, a little bit. So you'll see the mounting of that is off a little bit. The other thing they've done that PND also did on the shoulder is that rather than having all three joint uh, shoulder um, axes align at a single point, there's actually a little bit of an offset. So this roll around your arm here, if you were to extend that axis of rotation up with that, you'll notice it doesn't go to the center of rotation of the other two. It's offset just a little bit. That makes it mathematically challenging if you're writing a heuristic to solve it. You can solve it. It just makes the math like a headache, which is why a lot of uh, kinematicians like prefer to put them together. But there's like a, a little bit of a mechanical advantage to getting it offset like that um, as far as it being closer to the way human motion is. So that's like, ah, two things in the shoulder design that I like that they're they're following what I think is a good trend. And like I say, the first time I think I really saw anyone doing that was, was P&D. And then finally, you get down to the hip. And the hip, you'll see the other example. Everyone else is, uh, they have the horizontal rotation or, or mounting of the motors on the hip. You'll notice that in the pelvis down there, it's kind of offset a little bit. You see that little kind mm. of funnel shape that's in there? Correct. Because those motors are not mounted horizontally, they're mounted that way. And that's actually a lot closer to the way our hips are designed. So it, yeah. um, and I'm glad to see that they went ahead and did that. Um, so that that's another very good advantage or new part of the design. Now, another thing is that we'll get a close up of the torso itself. At some point here, we're going to see the torso. Um, so if we just stop for a second, imagine what's going on is that everything. So just pause for one second there. Most yeah. everything is a rotary motor where things are like kind of built right on top of one. Yeah. And we've seen a lot of these other bots also have movement in the torso. The Tesla right. bot, not so much because they decided that they didn't need that much there. And they kind of took away degrees of freedom, whereas others have put some in there. And a lot of times the way they do it is you end up stacking one motor on top of another. So if you look at, again, at the wrist that we're seeing, you'll see an example of like, you get a motor back here, you get another motor here, and then, you know, maybe another. So you're, you're stacking them up, which means you have this very long chain of stuff, which occupies space. If you want to have a fully moving torso, and again, you look at some of the other designs that some of the other robot companies have, have you get a motor on top of a motor on top of a motor. Suddenly, your whole bot gets very, very tall, and all that space eats into your torso. It takes away space in the torso. So when you look at the Unitree, uh, if you look at the, uh, the Sanctuary Bot, stuff like that, they have a very small upper torso because they basically take up a lot of room with that spine because they want right. to get that spinal movement. 
And you'll notice that they have a very big torso. And if you also look at the figure bot, the figure bot has a very big torso. And I put out a, um, a post just a few minutes ago comparing it to, and that basically figure was the first time I saw the kind of waste we're going to see here. So when we get a close up right now of, the, of this bot, we're going to notice these two levers that are in there. We're going to notice that they, they're not doing a serial chain mechanism there but they actually have a parallel kinematic. And I'll kind of point out a little bit what's going on now. Tesla bot doesn't have that, but if we get, mm. get back to here, when, it's, when it comes in closer, we are going to see exactly how they set that up. So when it comes around and walks in and keep on coming a little bit more, stop right there. Okay. So if you look down that torso area, you'll see they have a motor down the bottom that's basically in the pelvis to spin the whole thing around. Right. Okay? right. Notice that motor is below there. It's not taking up any space. Then they have what is called a cardinal joint. It looks like a, a universal joint that's together like this. And that is an idle joint. So it's not actuated there. The way it's yeah. actuated is you've got these two black bars that you might see in there that go up and down. They're connected to these rotary motors up the top to change the, um, the movement on that, which is what allows you to get the movement on the torso of leaning forwards and backwards. The same way this idea that you know the, the, the Tesla bot wrist goes backwards and forwards with these push-pull rods. Um, right. And then if you make it differentially, you can then make it lean from one side to another. What that means is that those two actuators are hidden on the left side and the right side, kind of where your kidneys are. Okay. So basically they've put those things in there and those motors stay down low. They're not stacked up, which means yeah. that area above that thing, that's all batteries. Okay. Mm. Yeah, yeah. So what they want to do is they wanted to maximize the volume of that torso right. to put a lot right. of batteries in there. Tesla bot has a lot of batteries in there too because of the same idea. We didn't want to do it. You look at some of these other bots that are out there, you'll notice I'm, I'm like, where are they putting the batteries? <laughs> <laughs> because, you know, the, the, the whole torso is basically the spine that's coming up and you get this teeny weeny little thing up top. It's like you're not sticking a whole lot of batteries in there. Which is why yeah. the lifetime of those bots is only like a couple of hours of operation. Yeah, yeah. So that means what Boston Dynamics is, is uh, they're not looking at a one hour runtime here. They're they're trying to probably get in that same space of maybe up to eight hours. And eight also hours, the fact that, you know, shift, that yeah. it might be that you know their actuators are a little bit power hungry because they want strength. Because mm. they, they may be making them very, very strong. So that's the reason why they're doing it. That's the reason Figure's doing it as well. And so right. it, it's, it's a similar design. They're all going to iterate on that. You know, I'm sure figures, you know, that was the figure zero one. They're definitely going to be iterating on that design. Um, they, it's probably one of those things that everyone has seen these designs all over the place. It's not like anyone's copying anyone else. If anyone's they're copying, they're, yeah. they're copying something else that wasn't like a textbook, a mechanical engineering textbook, probably from the nineties or something like that. So these, these ideas are out there. It's just a question of pulling them in and deciding yeah. what's going to be appropriate and why that works. So that's why yeah. it's not, you know, in many ways, stacking rotary motors together is very easy to do, you know, because you have the advantage that your actuator is also your hinge. You get a two in one, nothing could be better than that. So why would you go to the expense of putting in those little lever arms there and all that? Because there's extra pin joints in there. It's making things more complicated. Well, because space claim, you're trying to find a different way to do it. Yeah, yeah, and um, just just to go back to the point of uh, this the power and how much how many hours it can work. I think from our one of our earlier discussions, we I think a digit from um, agility was what about two and a half to three hours per charge. Yeah, I think it might you know depending on what it's doing, it might be able to hit as high as three hours. They were definitely running it for at least from an hour to fifteen. It may have been as high as an hour and a half at the trade show they were, at, but they were always clearly well past an hour. I was looking at when they would do the exchange and stuff like that. So it's like, okay, they are. And I think they could go two and a two to two and a half hours. Um, and then you get a charge and they they charge really quick. So all of them are around this idea of charging very quick. Um, uh, Baron of one X, their bot will run for about an hour mm. and it's a very light bot. <laughs> so it's not going to require a whole lot. And part of keeping yeah. it light is also, if you only want to be 60 pounds, you cannot have 10 kilograms of batteries. Yeah. That, that, that's your, that's your mass budget right there. So yeah. I, I think that's about that's, where the Tesla that is a limiting bot, factor. Yeah. I think I look, I and, think my, I guess I have, I have to double check, but I think the Tesla bots at least 10 kilograms uh, just in the batteries itself. 
So um, if you want to make it lighter, oh, just to make it lighter, I, you I, don't I, need as much battery. The main thing is charging. So what One X is saying is that all their customers want is a five minute recharge. If you can charge in five minutes, we're fine with like an hour uh, of okay. total usage before we have to charge again. So then, how does that work out for the household? Because if you if you have to well, the household, that's recharge. perfect because it, it's it's you know the household is not a factory where okay. you're expected to, yeah. to like work sure. eight hours straight or something like that. The sure. household, oh, we just get cleaning duties that have to get done. And like, yeah. you know, you work for 50 minutes and you go sit down and take a break. I mean, it's like, everyone does that. It's like, come on, right. And when you need to go to do duties around the house, all the chores, your wife is getting to once an hour, you're sitting down for five minutes. Right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so it's like, and, and in many, many cases, you don't necessarily be fast so long as the job is done. So like one, one thought I've always had is like, okay, uh, there's two ways I can get my lawn cut. I, I can have a professional or I can pay the kid down the road. The kid down the right. road is going to bring his small little lawnmower and he's going to be pushing around. It's going to take him like 90 minutes to do my lawn. Yeah. The professional comes in, he's done in 20 minutes. Yeah, sure. Okay? Now, all I care is that when I come home from work, the lawn is cut. I don't yeah. care if it takes someone 90 minutes or 20 minutes so long as it's done. And Absolutely. the kid down the street costs 15 bucks. Yeah. You know, versus you know, so so I mean that's 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 the thing versus the professional, which might be like thirty five or fifty bucks. So it's it's like okay, uh, is time of the essence? Time isn't necessarily the essence so long as the task is done in a timely manner. That's the big difference. Um, yeah. And yeah, so the household bot, you don't need you don't need to be super quick, nor do you want mm-hmm. to be because that's dangerous to have something that is For running sure. around your house yeah. like the flash. It's just like. No, yeah. things are going to yeah. get knocked over. Um, an industrial setting, it may be a little bit different. So this is the big thing everyone's talking about is what is battery life going to have to be like? Do we need to have an eight-hour battery or can it be a bit lighter? Do we do swappable and everything else? But I can see with Boston Dynamics, they're making sure they have adequate battery life to be able to do something. that's definitely going to run more than an hour. I'm, I'm sure they get a couple hours out of that. thing. Okay. I have a question before we proceed further, and I want to go back to the um, to the genesis of, of Atlas. So it was meant to be uh, essentially disaster response, mm-hmm. right? Exactly. So it was meant to be really, really hardy. It was meant to intended to have a lot of uh, power, or at least the requisite strength and power to deal with the uh, circumstances um, and the environment when, you know, if you... If you have to rescue people from a collapsed building, you need to be able to pick up heavy loads, right? Um, yes. And you need to be able to work for an extended amount of time. Right. Do you, do you see that ethos still being carried over in Gen 2 of Atlas? Um, possibly. Um, you know, if it's still got the same strength, that, that could be rather interesting. And... I'm not sure what the endurance is that they were looking at those time. I think they were saying it's like to get at least an hour out of it because, you know, hopefully if there's a burning building, you get the person out within an hour, not eight hours. So you don't need an eight hour battery. You just like, whatever's yeah. needed to get in there and do it. Unless yeah. it's some sort of long-term disaster. Um, mm. The, you know, the spot bot is very good at being able to get into very narrow areas. Yeah. And, you know, looking at this as remember the discussion we had with, with uh, Nathan Peterman and that, I was saying that the problem with these bots is that their walking speed is not quite the same as the humans, but it's really bad. They're all really bad at being able to do the pivot. It's right. like, that's where all the time is wasted when you pick up a box and kind of turn around. And he said, it's not a power problem. It seems to be a software problem. And I'm just going to, well, if it's a software problem, why hasn't anyone fixed it yet? Because I'd, I'd really like to be able to turn the dime. You see, this one is kind of solving the pivoting problem um, mechanically by being double jointed. And, and it's just going to be weird. I mean, the box is going to be facing this way and then yeah. the legs are going to come around and then the whole torso is going to spin. And so, boom. So yeah. in many ways, that might be a nice way of being able to solve the, the being able to, to turn on a dime by literally turning on a dime almost. That doing- was my first reaction right. when I saw this. I was like, yep. oh, wow, that's going to be really, really useful in tight spaces to be able to could be in very tight spaces. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So it may be that this is able to get access to some of those disaster relief areas where it's really tricky to kind of go through. You have that extra dexterity sometimes to do what you need to do. Yeah. It's not clear that you necessarily need that in a, in a factory industrial environment, but I could be proven wrong because the, the factory industrial environment is designed for humanoids right now mm. for humans, which means Every you know you only need that 
you need the same range of motion will work there. And the reason we don't have our spaces designed for this work, this range of motion is because we don't have it. <laughs> and so the, yeah. the question comes that when you start having humanoids with this different range of motion, does that mean you can start redesigning those workspaces? And right. when you start doing that, that means you are really designing it specifically for these machines as opposed to something that would be swappable. So, so you, right you now, have a lot of career problem. experience in this. Yeah. Right. I mean, what, how, how much of, a, uh, of, of uh, a boost is this aspect to designing factories primarily oh, be huge. on bots like these? It, 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 it'll, be, it'll be huge. So in the beginning, it's just going to be sort of swapping out um, existing workspaces with the bot. So um, it may it won't be like a wholesale uh, swap out. It might be that occasionally they're going into spelled humans or you know depending on the numbers that are in there. Um, but once you don't really need humans in the workspace, you can completely reconfigure it. You can get rid of all the safety equipment. So you know, safety fencing, you can reduce that. Um, you you also have a lot of sensors to make sure humans aren't walking in a particular area. You'll be able to change that quite a bit. You also will allow these machines to get closer to the industrial bots and the other equipment you're dealing with. So you're, there's always these huge case safety concerns and safeguards to make sure people are not injured by this equipment, which is extremely dangerous. Yeah. And, and part of it is that a, a human could interact very closely with this equipment if they're on their toes. Mm. And so like, you know, you, you can do these things that you could, you could feed a you know, piece of equipment to a machine, you know, very quickly and going out there, you know, you're doing it. You just can't do that eight hours straight. You know, yeah. you're, you're going to have fatigue. You're going to get uh, distraction, something like that. And so you you have to design all these things in that if for some reason something happens that a person leaves their hand underneath there for too long, the equipment will stop immediately because it senses yeah. something like that uh, to avoid injury. <clears throat> you also want to make sure before process stops that the human that was interacting with it is is backed off at a safe distance. And they do all kinds of things like you've got these. Uh, what they call palm out and some of them might even have two that the, the person literally has to put their hands on like two of these things to say, yeah, we're absolutely out of it. And we know it because the only way this can be active is that our palms are on there as opposed to doing some cheat where you like trick the thing thinking you're out of there, even though you're still in. So they do all sorts of, of things like that just to make sure there's, there's no injury. Um, if you can get rid of that, you can then increase the cycle time of a lot of your equipment because you're not worrying about the time it takes for a human to enter a cell and to leave a cell and that back and forth. So you, mm. your, your movement will be less, your footprint gets less. I mean, there'll be all kinds of things, but that that's later generation factories. It's not going to be they reconfigure the factory today because they've already invested a lot of that. There's a lot of cost in that already. What you want mm. something is that it's one-to-one -one swappable. So you don't necessarily need something with that range of motion. Um, it, it will be interesting. And there's, there's, let's say, a healthy debate in the community on whether you want to have double jointedness in the box. We all know it can be done. Yeah. yeah. And do we because want, do we need that? Yeah. I was going to ask you, um, do you think this is something that's now setting a precedent and then it is, the it is, it is, it is, it is, it um, is. I mean, a lot of the others can, can and cannot do it. So for instance, the design that Tesla bot came up with for the elbow is they actually have um, the bar mechanism that's pushing it forward. Right. So they actually having a linear drive, which, makes the elbow go forward their elbow cannot go double jointed because it's just mm. not possible so they right. they with that design you can't do it also same thing with everyone's knees um i think even the, the atlas knees are not double jointed because of the way it's actually you just can't do it uh if you look at like the figure bot and some of the others um they actually have a rotary actuator at the elbow and same with a lot, a lot of the other bots uh, from china they could be double jointed on the elbow without a problem the other thing that uh, I think was it the Xiaomi bot, I'm trying to remember, uh, was um, they showed also an example where they could rotate the elbow by such a, an amount to kind of come around was almost being like double jointed on your elbow. So, so they had their wrist coming around quite a bit on this. this I, they were kind of going in to a car to test the seatbelt yeah. tensor and they rotated the wrist around in what was kind of a very unnatural way when you when you look at it. But for the bot right. up, real easy sort of thing to do. Now, so was, was, that a, was that a result of, of, of uh, a greater number of joints? Um, no, no. It's just, it's just that the, the range of motion is better because hmm. uh, 
they were taking this range of motion here on the wrist that we can do like that. We can go back and forth in this. This is basically your, your wrist roll. Um, and when you put a motor there, in theory, that motor can go like plus or minus infinity if you want. Um, right. We are like barely plus or minus one. I mean, there's some people that might be plus or minus 180. Most people it might be like plus or minus 160 or something yeah. like that. It's, it's, I mean, the, the way to tell is like, I can get my thumb all the way down here and I can rotate it. And can I get my, th I can't get my thumb all the way around. I mean, how far yeah. can I get it yeah. around like this? I can't quite get that. Um, with these bots, they can do more than plus or minus 180. They could do maybe plus or minus 360. What's going to limit them is um, the cabling that goes through. Does the cabling start getting wound up as it needs to get down the line, you know, from here to there? It's not necessarily the cables coming into that motor. It's the cables after the motor. <laughs> yeah. And it just and got me thinking because motion. it's not just about the range of motion, but if you compare it to a human hand, it, I was just thinking as you, you were describing it there, it's also about the power that you can exert in a particular position. Yeah, if, well, if in, I, in some, in some cases, hand, you would lose it, right. Yeah. So if you have something that's purely rotary, in any position, you're going to be able to put the same torque on it because the, the motor doesn't really care. When you have something that has like the push-pull rods on there, you, it's, your lever arm is changing. So in some configurations, you get a lot more power than others. And then at some point, mechanically, you can't do it because the system breaks. I mean, me mechanically, you can't do it because the lever arm has to start going through. and Or you, you get into... Um, uh, the, um, forget the term, but you, um, uh, you're kind of in a deadlock where right. you get kind of locked in there and depending on which way you go, it may go like move it this way or move that way. And you don't want to be in that kind of situation where it's not yeah. clear which way it's going to go if you continue to extend the rod. So those, you could kind of design them to be that way, but you really wouldn't. I mean, it's just like it bottoms out and that's it. And I think they, they even on those designs, they don't go straight with the elbow. They, they will go to maybe about 175 degrees, not all the way, because we really can't do it with our arms. I mean, you think yeah. our arms can go straight up? Yeah, Just try yeah. it and tell me how often you really have that. At that point, you're almost hyperextending. Most people will feel yeah. more natural like that. Same thing with our knees yeah. is that is that they keep on talking about it, the difficulty of walking and having actually what they call the straight knee, that humans are able to do that, and most of these bots can't. That's why they're kind of squatting down when they walk. Uh, it's kind of a control system problem. At the same time, you never really want your knee all the way out there. That's it, you're at that hyperextended kind of location. But when it's yeah. squatting down, the more it squats down, the more power it actually has on the knee, because you, that oh, lever arm is getting much bigger. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And as it starts yeah. to get straight, you 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 have less ability around the knee unless you built an actuator right on in there. And we can see where the quote the calf muscles are on the Tesla bot at that point. That's used for those push pull rods that yeah. are, are pretty much going down to the ankles to allow the ankles uh, to actuate. Yeah. And that's a common yeah. thing. So it seems like Boston Dynamics is doing the same thing in the new Atlas. They've, they've got a similar configuration down there, well hidden behind like all the, the, the covers and, and everything they have to, to protect everything. Um, you know, the biggest problem is what kind of covers are going to have to come up with around the shoulder and everything else that are potential pinch points and also around the waist. Yeah. But again, that, that could all be done with fabric or, other things yeah i'm just i'm just looking at the structure of the legs as uh, as it's lying down here on the ground um so the the, the feet look a lot like the the like optimus um but it's yeah. as you you're right as you're pointing out that the calves the structure i don't know is it is it kind of encased in what we're seeing yes 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 so what you're seeing is that everything is encased in there and you can't see it and then occasionally you could see a glimpse of the rods that are coming down to actuate the um the feet. And I think we see it kind of from the backside. It's a little bit hard to see from the front, but they have what looks like a cardin joint actually down there at the, um, at the bottom where the, the ankle is. And then mm -hmm. you might see in, in, when, when you blow this up, that, you know, full screen on a big monitor, you can see it pretty well that those are coming out and they're probably coming from uh, two different rotary actuators that are in there. Um, that are hidden behind it. If you want to see an example, there's, um, I think both Agility and PND, they kind of expose where their actuators are and they don't have them like next to each other. They have them kind of stacked like this with mm. one of those rods that goes down there. One's a little bit longer than the other and, and they design them to make sure they get out of their way. In this case, um, Boston Dynamics just wanted to make sure that stuff was was well covered up. So it's not yeah. a potential source of a snag or a pinch or anything else. Yeah, th that and, and that... So that means there's um, there's a lot less to 
in the evolution of a lot of this bot when it comes to deployment, the final deployment. Because you, you have a lot of it encased already. You don't have um, like the Optimus, the early versions of Optimus, where you've got all, all the bits and bobs, you know, hanging mm -hmm. out there mm -hmm. and exposed. This seems to be kind of a smoother, more encased, more finished yeah. product yeah. So already. Already, already. I mean, they, they, they thought a lot about it. So things are well encased. The knee is not double jointed again because it's it's actuated pretty much through these rods that are, are around it. So you've got a freewheeling knee that's there. You can kind of see right there when it's exposed, yeah. you can get an idea of, of how that actuation is being done back there. And then you can see that the, the motor that's way on up there to actually provide yeah. the, uh, the power that you need. If you look closely at the hip, um, they've done something which I was, I'm expecting Tesla and others to potentially do is that, if you remember Tesla, we, they have like the same actuators being used in multiple places. And they designed right. the actuators that you can put them together like Legos in different configurations, yeah, stack yeah. them together. The thing is, yeah. there, in many cases, they have kind of this double joint that you want to have that they build with two motors. And what looks like Boston Dynamics has done is that they've integrated those two motors together into like one casing. So yeah. it, it looks to me that they've decided, aha, rather than stacking these two things together, let's see, can we actually make a motor that has two axes coming out at different directions? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, yeah. there's two windings in there, you know, the, everything else, but they sort of thought about is like, we want a common housing for these two rather than two motors that we stick together. And that yeah. means things are definitely more compact. You can probably share a lot of electronics in your power that's being routed through there. So there's, there's a lot of reasons to do that. Um, as opposed to the, this idea that we just have a bunch of these common components that we can fit together any way we want. Yeah. So just explain this, what, what we're looking at, because that the, the, the hip joint, the entire hip structure looks very, very solid and stable. Right. But right. at the same time, it, because of, of these double jointed uh, uh, and, and the, and the range of motion of the, of these joints, it's, it's just, it's just, weird because it you know it it's solid and stable and yet mm -hmm. so flexible in the form factor it's just amazing yes now what i'm assuming here is that uh if we look in the back uh we can see those two black circles that are kind of pointing towards us that are in the hip and that's the, yeah. the, the axis that causes what's called like the abduction that causes your your legs to basically split out like that okay mm -hmm. they have that then they have right underneath it the motor that makes your knees kind of go backwards and forwards like that, and uh, I think that's uh, that is the pronation I think, and mm. so that motor is sort of built into the same unit. Looking at that, I don't. It, it could be coming from the bottom of that leg because that leg looks pretty beefy, but I think they're not doing that in the bottom part. I think the actual uh, motor is up a little bit higher because there's no reason why that whole housing would have to be so big if you're only doing it for this actuation. So they got one unit for doing that and then the rotation of the knees back and forth. And then you get into what is like that hamstring area and you'll see that's very voluminous in there because they're trying to pack in um, what they need for that knee to be able to get the, the power they need in there. Pretty yeah. sure because it looks like it's horizontal. I don't see uh, something else that's on there. So that that joint looks pretty big. Could be yeah, wrong that it, if if they are actually putting the motor in the lower part of the leg, but I think it might actually be in the upper part of the leg. Yeah, because at, at this in this frame you can see both angles. You can see it yes. uh, head on and then laterally. Yes, yes, and that's that rotational axis around there, which is allowing the knee to spin around in any direction. Now, they don't have any lower rotation of the leg. So they don't have the ability for the toes to point any different direction and neither do any of the other humanoid bots out there. Neither can we. <laughs> Most people, if you try pointing your toes in a different direction than your knee is facing, um, you, it, it, it hurts. <laughs> it's, it's not easy. So you'll see basically when the toes point in a certain direction, they're pointing the same direction as the knee. That's really where they should be. So they only have two degrees of freedom down here, which is really all you need. I've heard some people arguing that whether you need to have that, I don't think you need to have the toes pointing in a, in a di direction different than the knee. 
So, so when you look at that, you'll see that actually the getting the toes, the point in the different direction is being the a result of a motor way up here. It's not underneath the knee. It's way up at the top. That's where that activity is coming because they're, they're moving that thing all the way around. And that's that weird, uncanny kind of double jointedness that we're seeing that's coming right. from that because they're really able to display. So we can do that a little bit with our, our legs, but not to that degree. I mean, that, that is a lot of motion. Yeah, but, but also our, our physiology is, has evolved in step with our needs, right? We've evolved to be able to do what we need to do. And that's not necessarily the case with these bots because yeah. that's where the, yeah. you know, the advantage is. Yeah, yeah. It's, um, it's going to be interesting to see how, how much uh, the utility you get out of that. Part of the argument has always been that you don't want to give degrees of freedom that the human doesn't have if you need to be doing a lot of ro a telerobotic teaching. Because how, how case, do I right? persuade it to like spin? You know, it's like, I can't do this, you mm -hmm. know? So telerobotically, so clearly it has enough degrees of freedom to mimic what we have. But then mm -hmm. the decisions to do this other stuff is coming from some other data set. And it's definitely not coming from the, the human trained telerobotic set. Right, right. Um, so then what? Um, but then you can always have the bot, a bot like this with this range of motion and you know the double joints to kind of learn by watching, you know, like like Optimus learns by watching videos. Yeah, it's it part, and that's the part next of this, level. Yeah, and and again, this is an argument that a lot of people are, are making in the space is that how we want to train these these humanoids is that we want some telerobotics, we want some um, some simulation. And uh, we also want to do with observed learning. Yeah. And um, the interesting thing that that Bernd from One Axis said is that they are finding that real world beats simulation. That once they get in the real world, they can teach tasks a lot quicker than through simulation because the real world physics is you know correct, yeah. <laughs> whereas in the simulations it, it, it's not. And you might say, yeah, but you know I can do a million simulations in a computer million iterations a lot faster than I can do 100 in the real world. And he's like, yeah, not, not so quick. You'd be surprised. We're, we're getting to that point that they're doing it like in 10 shot or, 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 or 100, not having to have millions of that. And a lot of it comes down to cost and time. He says that sometimes it's more costly for that compute because that, that's a lot of compute. And while it, you may think it's pretty quick, you can do it the same way. So you want to have that ability to be able to teach it. And if it's you know, what's the point of giving it degrees of freedom? You can never teach because the, the human operators aren't going to. The other thing is that, you know, how much they're able to sort of observe, because eventually you, you want to be able to show the bot by showing a task that could be a video. And it needs to be able to relate with what it sees in the video on that, which is kind of an argument. It's like, why do we want to have five fingers? Why do we want to have the hand very much like the human hand? Because if you have a really weird kind of hand or gripper, then it's very hard for the robot to understand, oh, wait a minute, you know, what, what is it I'm supposed to do here? And then we'll be able to relate in some cases because, I mean, think about it. You know, our pets seem to understand the idea of catching a ball, right? They see us humans catching it with their hands, but they can't yeah. catch it with their hands, but they get the concept and they know yeah. they can do it with the mouth. <laughs> so, yeah. so, I mean, sometimes, the, you know, animals and others' intelligence can understand that, oh, okay, I don't have that same set. Of, manipul yeah. of manipulators, but there's the another way. To the solution can be different. Yeah. Yeah. So hopefully, you know, they're they're understanding that and figuring out how how to do that. But you still want to have a good mapping. If your mapping is very different, and this is part of the argument, it's like why we don't have these uh, uh, arachnid bots, yeah. because it's like how are we going to teach these things? You know, it's like <laughs> <laughs> you need Doc Ock, right, to be able to do something like that, to be able to to kind of relate to it. So yeah. the idea is, is the closer it is to the human body, the easier it is to do that mapping. Um, yeah. Now, the argument is like, well, you can still teach it. It still has the same degrees of freedom as us, just a little bit more. That's all. Yeah. Greater range yeah. of motion. Yeah. And maybe once it gets smart enough, it'll find solutions on its own that are more yeah. optimal. Which, which it will. Which it will. So, And, and that's the, the hope is at some point, these bots will kind of play and, and have a little sense of curiosity to see something mm -hmm. and from that learn from their own experience of like, oh, this works a little bit better. And, you know, clearly if, if you give, if you show the bot how to do a particular task and eventually realize, hey, wait a minute, I get this degree of freedom here. It allows me to do it real, you know, quicker and easier. That, yeah. That'll be fine. 
But you know what? At yeah. first, it'll probably just be learning to do the task the way as humans do it. And then when it realizes it has superhuman capabilities, it will then attempt to turn those things off. Yeah, yeah. And I'm just, you know, just thinking about just the earlier conversation we had, um, you know, about the NASA Mars program and sending bots to 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 Mars and maybe the moon first. Um, just the use cases are, are phenomenal. And with this extra level um, of flexibility and range of motion, wow. It just my mind. It's the mind boggles at the at the use cases that we haven't even begun to think about right now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So, um, mm -hmm. yeah, it, it's. Uh, I, I think it is really interesting to to see that you know boss dynamics uh, did not disappear. Um, they're yeah, going to come come back swinging. Uh, yeah. It's been. Actually, the past couple of weeks have been maybe a little bit quiet on the bot front. You know, we, we had a mm -hmm. lot of the announcements. We had the NVIDIA, which obviously had, had a lot of excitement there. Uh, and Tesla has been extremely quiet. And yeah. <laughs> uh, now this kind of comes out to fill that. We'll have to see what, what comes out. And the other thing I, I do want to point out is like, you know, look at the number on the back. Yeah, yeah. I was just going to come to that. But okay, so number before... Yeah, and let me just yeah, it flips around. Hang on, there you go. Yes, um, it's not just number one; it's double oh one. Double They're they're kind of sending this little signal there that we don't plan on making one or two. We we plan on making them. Yeah, you know, hundreds, if not thousands. Yeah. So, um, yeah, it's. Yeah, it's crazy. And do I do I do I spy a kill switch there? Uh, right there may green? be. Yeah, usually a kill switch would be a big red switch. The interesting thing is, is I I notice there's like some red lights glowing inside of some of the joints when it moves around, and I'm not sure what that's in there for. <laughs> it's like these LEDs that are inside illuminating something. I'm not quite sure why. I don't think that would be uh, for encoders or anything like that. Uh, so I think it's. It's still their first version of the new gen. That's reasonably refined, uh, and there will be more refinements as they go along. All right, let's talk about the head. Mm -hmm. So this gives me serious lost in space vibes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, I think they, they just wanted to to make it look non-threatening. I guess that's my understanding, and it is non-threatening. Um, it doesn't doesn't quite i think he said they had a couple other vibes that or or head designs that definitely had that terminator kind of look that they were trying to get rid of and looking kind of like a bathroom mirror um or or you know a ring light you know however you want to look at it i guess it's not threatening i assume they could probably display text or any other images on there but so that no one wants great, the right? smiles or the eyes because of that kind of uncanny valley so yeah. It's, you know, it's not, it's not threatening, but, you know, and the fact that it's round and not angular kind of gives yeah. it that um, softer, more friendly look, but at the same time, reminding everyone this, this is a machine that w when you start putting faces and everything else in here, you're, you're trying to anthropomorphize everything. And um, in many cases that they, they all want everyone to be, remember, this is just a machine. It's no different than your car. And it just happens to look like a human. Um, but you know, it's, it's, it's no more, or, or, you know, it's no more human than your car. Yeah. And it's definitely a machine that's, uh, you know, going to have intelligence in it. But, but that, but that is a screen and they could do a lot with it later on. I'm assuming it is. We haven't seen enough to, to know, but I would think they could probably put a screen there if they want. Okay. So what else, what else do you spy? Well, we did see an antenna there. So clearly there's a, like, oh yeah, yeah. Up for wireless communication of some sort. It's a pretty pronounced antenna. I don't know if they're yeah, trying to give, um, you know, sort of uh, Uncle Martin vibes from uh, <laughs> my favorite Martian. But, you know, there we go. It seems like, you know, again, they've got a lot of venting going on in the head. So I suspect that mm. it's not a hollow head. There must be a little bit more going on in there that, yeah. to require that amount of, um, of airflow. So it probably has some communication. I'm not seeing where the cameras I, yeah, are. Communication. The Do you think there's a speaker the back there? Pardon? Do you think there's uh, hardware for voice back there? It could be. It could be. I, I I would think they're integrating in LLMs just like everyone else. Yeah, you see a lot of venting space on the arm, on the right arm mm -hmm. as well. Yeah. And the elbows. Yep. yep. I think it's a really smart design to write next to the numbers on, on both sides of the back. 
yeah. to see more vending space. Yes, it's it's yeah. a really clean design, you know, for for a uh, for the for version one zero zero one of it is um, of it Gen is two. it is it is and um, it's not the final design, um, but you yeah, know, it's definitely it's an advanced design. They're going to learn a lot from it, and they're going to make what are improvements that they see because you know they they want to find out about you know reliability and durability. How long is it yeah. going to last? Can it fall as many times as um, as the old Atlas? Because uh, yeah. I think Nathan was telling us that everyone's yeah. really afraid about the bots falling. <laughs> that they usually fall two or three times before you know something yeah. really significant yeah. happens. Um, yeah. Learn from one X design their bot to be able to um, to fall down without any problem. And he says it can fall a thousand times, and there's like no damage to the bot. It's like, wow. <laughs> okay. So it'll be interesting to see how good this is uh, at falling repeatedly uh, without having any sort of damage. Also, you know, we 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 tend to brace ourselves for a fall. That, as Nathan, I remember, pointed out, because mm -hmm. we've got all our internal organs, our vital organs here, and you want to protect it as much as possible. But that's not the case with the bot, right? So yes, the the bot the bot could be different. They still need to to learn how to gracefully fall because a lot mm. of times it just sort of succumbs to the fact that it's falling. It's like, oh, I'm falling. Yeah. <laughs> it doesn't do anything. <laughs> it's like, come on, just just do something to kind of you know, prevent the damage. Just put yourself into a roll, drop the shoulder, whatever. Yeah. But even then, you know, if if they're so heavy and they come down on a hard surface like concrete, yeah. it's probably not much. You can yeah. Like our, yeah. our iPhones and stuff, you know, they're designed to be shockproof, but they still shatter. <laughs> you know, yeah, it's like, for sure. yeah. Yeah, Absolutely. no matter what you okay, try to uh, do. Let, let's talk about this motion. This mo this this reminds me of of Atlas Gen One, you know yep. the the jerky movement. Mm -hmm. I would have imagined that they would have got that sorted by now. What yeah, I think that that's the next thing. Is it it was making a lot of noise. So when you listen to it, it, it was just like going on out yeah, there. So yeah. uh, again, I think that's something that gets tuned with um, as they get more learning, as they, they do more training with this thing. Uh, they should be able to do it. If you've covered a lot of ground, um, let me pull up your um, profile on X just so that people can reach out to you. This is Scott uh, on X at Going Ballistic 5. Um, hey, just follow him. If you want to keep uh, abreast of everything that's happening in all things bots and humanoid bots and AI-enabled humanoid bots, Scott is your guy. Trust me. <laughs> okay. Yeah, thank you. Thank Ryan. you so much. It's been yep. great. Always great to have you. And uh, well, we're going to talk soon. Yeah, same here.